Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, Pictures Don't Lie, by Catherine McLean. I had been writing science stories for the Times for a few years before the whole business of the aliens came up. I got on to doing science because I wasn't a very good sports writer, and the Guild made it clear to the manager that I had enough seniority to make it tough to fire me. So, when Masters went over to Life magazine, I was shoved into his spot. Now, being the man from the Times on any given story is quite a responsibility. It's not quite as awe-inspiring as the London Times. You remember the butler announcing there were several reporters and a gentleman from the Times? But we're supposed to look as if we didn't specialize in axe murders and picking winners at Jamaica. Of course, it pays off. You find scientists, atomic energy commissioners, even congressmen will open up to the Times man. And that's how I got on the inside of this whole business. I had met Joseph Nathan at a convention in Atlantic City. And when he invited me to look over this work, I accepted. I don't think there's anything classified in this work, Mr. Schwartz, as long as I don't actually supply you the text of messages. I got a department clearance up to most confidential. That should do it. Hello, Max. Hi. Hi. You see, my job is radio decoder in the department here. Under the Pentagon directly? Department of Military Intelligence. Uh Uh-huh. I use a directional pickup to tune in on foreign bands, record any scrambled or coded messages I hear. I thought the code department was handled under CIA. Well, I guess there is some duplication. Actually, though, I concentrate on the scrambled messages. I see. Here, I can show you. Come over here. Look look out to the table. Anybody want coffee? I've got a piece of tape here. This is a typical scrambled broadcast. It's not military, it's a commercial message. Wait a minute till I thread up the machine. Sure. You know the basic principles. You take a straight voice message, run it through on an electronic scramble circuit. It may come out something like this. My job is to pick a thing like that out of the air, analyze the patterns and wire an unscrambler. I've got this particular pattern set up on the machine, you see. Tanker number 734, capacity code 7, estimated time of arrival at Galveston 30. You see? Mm -hmm. Now, that was just a commercial message. I do the same thing with military intelligence. Is it something like old-fashioned cryptology? Well, yes, except there's a small complication. You need a degree in advanced electronics, waveform math with a touch of quantum physics. I suppose it's quite challenging, then, every time you pick up a new signal. In a way. Actually, they do the same work in every country these days. Everybody knows it's just a matter of time before any scrambled pattern is broken. It's, it's pretty routine. Uh-huh. Ever pick up anything exciting? Well, actually, most of the messages, when I unscramble them, are still in prearranged code, and I have to turn them over to cryptology. It's something like copying Jabberwocky 500 times by longhand. (laughs) Well, there is something interesting here. Listen to this piece of tape. I don't hear anything. Well, that was it. Oh? Now listen, there's another one coming up. That's it. Well, I get that on my car radio, static. Yes, but that's from the stars. You mean radio interference? 
That's right. I think you wrote about the work at Bell Telephone and RCA Labs about radio telescopy mapping the star positions by static. Hmm. <laughs> You're interested in that? Not exactly. They've never been able to figure out why the static on these particular bands comes in such jagged bursts. Just doesn't seem natural. You have any ideas? Oh, I don't know. I've been kicking around the notion that it's not a natural phenomenon. I've been trying to discard it, sort of like playing chess against yourself on the train in the morning. Well, that's about all there is. That's all it was then. Joe Nathan swindling a few parts and a little government time to ride a hobby horse of his. I wrote up his job for the Sunday magazine section. It got squeezed out for an article by a famous actress on the ten leading roles I disliked the most. So I forgot about it, went back to announcing a miracle drug per week and conflicting theories of psychoanalysis. <laughs> I don't know what I'd do without them. They're always good for a piece. I was at the office late one night. I didn't have any work, but I just didn't feel like going home and putting the kids to bed. Schwartz. Mr. Schwartz? That's right. This is Joseph Nathan. Do you remember? Yeah, sure. How are you? Mr. Schwartz, can you come out to my lab? You mean Riverhead? Yes. I'd like to show you something. Well, maybe we can make an appointment. As a matter of fact, I have to be out on Long Island next week. No, I mean tonight. Oh? What is it? I think I've found something that you might be interested in. Yes? You know those static bursts I recorded? The ones that came from the stars? That's right. I've decoded them. When you write science for the Times, you don't often go dashing off on the trail of scoops, as in TV versions of newspaper life. But it was about a quarter to twelve as I drove out along the Montauk Highway listening to Tex and Jinx on the radio to keep from piling up the car against the tree. Radio who keeps me awake. Nathan was waiting for me at the gate, and he had quite an argument to get me in past the MPs. We were challenged four times before we got to his lab. I'm glad you came, Mr. Schwartz. Oh, it's a nice night for a drive. I know, I know, but frankly, I wanted to ask you what I should do. You see, I requisitioned the supplies without authorization. And I don't know how to explain it to my division chief. I mean, it isn't as if I took any of the equipment home. It's all right here. But I've got to tell somebody. I just thought you might have some experience in how to handle a thing like this. Like what? Well, you remember that static recording I played you? Here, I I got it set up. Oh, yeah. Yes, I remember it vividly. Now, Mr. Nathan, it's very late, and this is far out on Long Island. Now, you see, there's an old intelligence trick, speeding up on a recording till it sounds just like that, a short squawk of static, and then broadcasting it. Undergrounds use that when they don't want their transmitters located by triangulation. When you receive the broadcast, you slow it down and get your message. Oh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean that you've decoded those static bursts from the stars? Well, no, not exactly. I mean, they're not in code. You think there's somebody out there broadcasting at us? Well, no, it, it's not exactly that either. Everything all right in here, Joe? It's all right, Max. Mr. Schwartz has a clearance. Okay, see you in the morning. You see, if a star has planets, inhabited planets, and there was any broadcasting between them, they'd send it on a tight beam to save power. Uh-huh. It's the same method we used to aim radio beams at the satellite stations. Uh-huh. You don't lose power. But you couldn't aim from planet to planet. You can't expect a beam to stay on target over such distance more than a few seconds at a time. Mm -hmm. It'd be like trying to keep a flashlight on a bouncing ball from a mile away. Yeah, yeah, I see. So they naturally compress each message into a short half-second or half-length package and send it a few hundred times in one long blast to make sure it was picked up during the instant the beam swings across the target. You see? Huh? Well, uh... Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Uh, Is that what those static squawks were? I think so. I've got them analyzed up to a point, and they can't possibly be random. Oh? I recorded a couple of screeches from Sagittarius section, and I concentrated the work on them. It's taken me a couple of months to find the synchronizing signals, and 
set the scanners close enough to the right time to even get a pattern. 